Namaskar and welcome to BIC Talks a podcast by Bangalore International Center bringing you conversations that move inform and encourage discourse because ram goha mentions somewhere that there is a universality about gandhi's appeal and this is an important point because you know nehru ambedkar rajgopal acharya they are all very important intellectuals i am not denying that din dayal they are all very important intellectuals but they are important for us indians whereas gandhi has been at least in the political sphere important for martin luther king nelson mandela like bolesa you know for a for a wide variety of people around the world so although he might have lived all his life in sabarmati and sevagram and focused on this part of the world for his uh, actions his message and his thinking had a universal quality in the political area and as i kept digging my research i found that in the broader area of political economy also he had something which was original and which we could proudly stand up and say this is india's contribution author and founder of ahimsa conversations rajni bakshi engages author poet and entrepreneur jayati trao better known as jerry in a conversation based on his book Economist Gandhi the first book on Gandhi to claim that he was not against business and capitalists providing insights into a hidden facet of Gandhi's personality his thoughts on economics and capitalism while throwing light on some of Gandhi's views on religion ethics human nature education and society unveiling a Gandhi distinctive from all our previous readings of him This episode is adapted from a BIC stream session from 15th October 2021. Thank you so much Lekha and thanks to uh, Bangalore International Center for including me for inviting me in this event and congratulations Jerry on the book. Thank you. Uh, yeah and I can see that clearly it is just one marker in a longer and really heartfelt journey. of learning and discovery so i have a strong sense of fellowship with you know that that eagerness to go on journeys of discovery so what i'm proposing that we do today i'm saying this to all gathered that we'll spend about half our time on the book itself and then we'll spend maybe half our time on locating the arguments and the insights that jerry has shared in this book in the context of the contemporary crises the multiple crises uh, that uh, the human species is now faced with and how that relates to the market system so before we talk about the book itself uh, jerry i was thinking that it might be interesting for both of us to in a sense uh, confess that we have both taken journeys from the opposite directions and kind of met somewhere in the middle because i you know spent 20 years in grassroots activism and then spent 10 years studying how markets work and what is the significance and importance of the bazaar and you have come from mainstream business and now spent i think more than a decade studying gandhi and the economy so maybe we could just start with that can you share what drove you uh, you know personally firstly to to go on this journey and stay on it for so long and so intensely Thank you so much Rajni I think that's a that's a wonderful question and a good place to start you know both in economics and in politics my views were relatively anti Gandhi if you go back 10 or 15 years is not much of a secret I've always been a great admirer of the British Raj which the Mahatma opposed all his life and on economics one wrote him off as a luddite as a uh, as an anti modernist if you will and um, left it at that what happened was just a series of serendipitous events ira pande at the indian international center uh, got in touch with me and said she is doing a gandhi jayanti edition of the india international center quarterly and would i try and put something together 
about Gandhi and corporate governance. I was kind of reluctant, but anyway, I said, let me take a look at this. And I came up with a short and reasonably well thought out piece. I then showed it to Shishir Jha, my friend and mentor at IIT Bombay. And he said, you know, Jerry, you're, you're onto something that might be much bigger. Why don't you examine the political economy issues in a, in a bigger scale? You might end up positioning the Mahatma as, a, as an unlikely guru for our students. So, and this is coming from IIT Bombay, from the business school, it was quite of started getting me thinking. Then I immersed myself in Gandhi. Uh, over the years, I've kind of visited Ahmedabad. Uh, I have visited Durban and Phoenix. Uh, I've gotten into Gujarati texts. And of course, a lot of the work that you've done, Rajni, looking at uh, the collected works of the Mahatma and how to use modern technology to do word searches around there. All of that started, and then I read a lot of books about Gandhi. Uh, so it just kept going and going. It took 10, 12 years for the final product to emerge. And uh, each year I became a greater admirer of the man. Not that I am unaware of his foibles or weaknesses, and I still don't call myself a Gandhian, but I am completely in awe of his intellect, and I think that is greatly underappreciated. Yeah. Everybody thinks of him as a politician, <laughs> but that he was an intellect who gave, who made an enormous intellectual contribution to 20th century political economy and, and various things, ethics or whatever, is something that uh, we've kind of not grappled with. And this book and this journey gave me that chance. And it's, you're right. I think your journey from the other side, why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> well, in a sense, because I realized by about 99, the activist communities are spot on about the need end of the spectrum, meaning how people's needs are being neglected, they are being violated, they are uh, even their basic rights very often. But that more of the same kind of organization by itself, I realized, was not going to solve these problems. And, and around that time, of all people, I came under the influence of, uh, well, I wouldn't say came under the influence, but I was very struck by something that George Soros wrote. And he said it was his part of his testimony to the U.S. Congress. And George Soros, who in a sense, I think is easily, at least for the last two decades of the 20th century, the icon of, you know, the world of uh, uh, finance and in some ways. He said that markets are inherently unstable. And society can only handle so much instability and no more. And that it is markets must be there to serve society, not the other way around. So that's what put me on my journey. And the result was Bazaar's Conversations and Freedom. Um, but to come back to why we are here today, Jerry, you know, we are in a time in India in particular. I don't know, maybe this is happening in other parts of the world. Maybe Africa is going through the process too different countries in Africa, that there is renewed interest in decolonization. Not, of course, uh, in, a, in the old way, but the decolonization of the mind. And there is a very intensive, for example, in India just now, an intensive exploration of and a seeking for an Indic and a Dharmic frame. Now, your book is fascinating because it overlaps between Indic and Western traditions. And I find that this kind of, you know, like good watercolors that are flowing into each other, this worldview that you represent in a time when there's actually a lot of polarization is what I wanted to put down first as what I appreciated up front in the book. So was this, was this intended, uh, Jerry, did you start from that perspective of trying to merge the Indic and the Western or... Is that the outcome of the journey? Actually, it was a 
kind of variant of that. Very early in our conversations, Shishir and I and a couple of other people, we said, you know, at the end of the day, India and Indians have not contributed to the intellectual development of modern economics or, you know, we are not seen. Uh, the, and, and even the odd Indian who is seen is ensconced in, in uh, uh, Western academia. And uh, uh, what's the original thing? You know, if, if Marx was an original thinker uh, that came out of Germany in the 19th century, is there anything original that Indians have contributed? And that is where I think we both said, you know, this man has this original thinker. He is not simply a, 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 a person who takes up, because if you look at most uh, uh, Indian kind of research, it will be, we're replicating what has been done in some other place, empirical research, for instance. Uh, US stock market research was done 30 years ago. Some PhD student in India will do Indian stock market research comparable to that. The second thing that we kind of stumbled upon was that there is a universality, and I owe this to Ram Guha, because Ram Guha mentions somewhere that there is a universality about Gandhi's appeal. And this is an important point because, you know, Nehru, Ambedkar, Rajagopalachari, they're all very important intellectuals. I'm not denying that. Dindayal, they're all very important intellectuals, but they're important for us Indians. Whereas Gandhi has been, at least in the political sphere, important for Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, like Walesa, you know, for a, for a wide variety of people around the world. So although he might have lived all his life in Sabarmati and Sevagram and focused on this part of the world for his uh, actions, his message and his thinking had a universal quality in the political area. And as I kept digging my research, I found that in the broader area of political economy also, he had something which was original and which we could proudly stand up and say, this is India's contribution. But you know, like all intellectual contributions, when you talk about Marx, you talk about his descent from Hegel, you talk about Fichte, Schelling, you talk about Kant. So when you talk about any great thinker, you talk about what is, when you talk about T.S. Eliot, you talk about Dante, you talk about, you know, where do these, uh, St. Augustine, where, where do these ideas come down from? In Gandhi's case, that became a bit of an obsession with me. In fact, I would say two thirds of the book is about the roots of his thinking, not, not only what the thinking is, but where did he get these ideas from? And uh, I identify kind of five broad areas, three of them distinctly Indian and one very underestimated Indian and two um, distinctly Western. So he is a, 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 a child of multiple intellectual traditions, if you will, which is what most great intellectuals are. They are never only in one, one line. They, they take from different traditions and blend them together. So the three Indic or Indian ones, and all three of them are vaguely dharmic too, to use your expression, were the Ishavasya Upanishad, Gandhi's own eccentric interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita, which many of us may not agree with. Huh? But for what it is worth, that too is an Indian tradition where a commentator is allowed to make uh, a radically different eccentric interpretation of a Vedantic text that's not uncommon in, in, in the way Vedantic tradition moves uh, and has been going on for at least 1300 years. The uh, third one was something totally underappreciated, I believe, which is the Gujarati Baniya tradition. And I stumbled on a very interesting paper by Dvijendra Tripathi on the Nagar Sheds of Ahmedabad. And then I started, then I went to Ahmedabad. I met Samway Glalbai, who's the current chairman of the uh, Ananji Kalyanji Trust, 
which manages a lot of Jain temples. It's a 400 year old organization, which manages Jain temples all over Western India, including Ranakpur and all. And he gave me the Gujarati text, Ananji Kalyanji Pidino Itihas, which I have got a person to translate. And I think eventually I'll bring that out as a separate book. Uh, it's not a very good translation, so I'm working on doing that. So these were three traditions that I found that have become very important. And I'll talk a little bit about each of them later. On the Western side, I saw that Gandhi is basically an English barrister. He is completely, deeply immersed in English common law. A um, little bit of Roman law, he studied, in fact, Roman law when he was in London. But really, English common law, he's, one of his favorite books was a book called Snell's Equity. Now, equity is a principle only there in uh, uh, common law. It's not there in the continental and code Napoleon kind of systems. And he always praised Snell's Equity. And he said, when he read the Gita, he has written somewhere, I saw immediately parallels to Snell's Equity. So this was a very interesting and so I explored quite a bit of what Gandhi and I, I found that there was a lot in common between Gandhi and a great English scholar called Maitland, mm -hmm. uh, History of English uh, Law, he has written. Uh, although Gandhi himself quotes uh, Henry Maine in his references in Hind Swaraj, who right. was Maitland's mentor. So it, th there's that English legal tradition that is there. Yeah. Then the other one I found was the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Gandhi knew both Matthew and Mark Gospels by heart, huh, by the way. He didn't need to make reference. He could quote from them by heart. Uh, and he was very much uh, influenced by them. The, the, the interesting thing is also it was not just the King James Bible, which he was, of course, very fond of, but certain unusual traditions within the Christian denominations like Quakers and Pietists and Trappists, all of whom he had friends among or he had some influence from. So there was this Christian kind of influence. Again, in his own eccentric way, huh? Gandhi didn't take anything the way others might take them. He, he, I, I've mentioned twice in my book, Gandhi was like Humpty Dumpty in Through the Looking Glass. Any word would mean whatever he chose to make it mean. So that he used this to internalize it. And in the Bhagavad Gita, which, which is eccentric interpretation, he used to justify nonviolence in politics, which most people have found unacceptable. I have said, I'm not interested in politics. Let me look at the economic side of it. And there I uh, bumped into this idea that Gandhi first, he didn't know Sanskrit till he had to learn a little bit in Yarabda Jay. He came through many of these texts from their English translations. The first translation he read was Edwin Arnold's uh, Song Celestial. Mm -hmm. And Edwin Arnold was a high church Englishman who translated it in a very Anglican Protestant way. So suddenly I was able to establish, and especially Scott Barton's work helped me uh, in the connection with Max Weber's views on the development of the Protestant ethic and modern capitalism. So now I had a full set of things. And I'll talk later about how I explored Gandhi's relationship with other economists later. But yeah. these are, now we're still on the roots. These five roots is what I kind of put together when yeah. I, where did this man get these ideas from? Uh, he original, he synthesized them in his own original way but he got them from these five sources. Great. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I enjoyed how you, how emphatically you have said that uh, Marx Weber got India wrong. Yeah. And maybe later on, you can explain that a bit more, but I think it flows well from these five points that you've uh, highlighted uh, to talk about the fact that documenting the emergence of the concept of trusteeship in Gandhi's life and his thinking and his action is uh, that documentation I found was the richest part of the book. And here again, you are explaining both the Indian 
independent indian influences and the western influences so you know what is this this fascinating story and because i feel it's the foundation of your narrative and you for example you raise a important issue as to whether english common law benefited from the indian theory or whether indian knowledge was added to dominant western theory as Absolutely. deviant histories so if you could hear you know just uh, yeah. un, un, unfold for us what you learnt about trusteeship the the trusteeship thing we all know that it's it's uh, supposed to be a jewel of english common law but if the gujarati jains could have a trust they may not have called it a trust they called it a pd 450 years ago long before there was any english influence this idea that everything we have is only derived from western influence is at one stroke demolished then when and, and it is so interesting talking to this guy lal bhai tells me you know mr rao he is very simple fellow very well the guy powerful guy but very simple fellow he says we are not the trust doesn't own the temple i said yeah but the title deeds say that the trust owns it no no lord adinath owns the temple we are only managing lord adinath's property so then i explored this and this goes back rajni it goes back to bharata putting rama's paduka on uh, the throne and That's saying right. i am ruling uh, kosala on behalf of these padukas see this idea that yeah. the, the the deity is the owner and yeah. then of course in the, the, this is where you see the nice intertwining of english and indian things which is why i i be, keep saying with all its faults the raj was a was an important uh, landmark in the development of indian intellect the it comes up in some case in british india in bombay high court and in calcutta high court a deity and then this goes all the way to the privy council and it is confirmed that a deity is a juristic entity that's a point i have made yeah is, are we oh. saying that the english created juristic entity or did we create juristic entity the raja of travancore martanda varma surrendered his kingdom to uh, padmanabha and said i am mm. ruling on his behalf so these are hori indian traditions these are not new traditions and But, so the, 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 this it was quite quite fascinating after all yeah. ishravasya upanishad is older than the, the gospels now everybody knows that and uh, ishravasya vedam sarvam so the, the, that the world is permeated by the energy of of the lord and therefore the world cannot belong to us wealth cannot belong to us we should not covet wealth we must therefore manage it as trustees hey yeah yeah though i must say jerry that i would have liked to see more about the folk traditions and maybe when you when you revisit this work second edition or, or your next level yeah. because uh, what large institutions like ananji kalyanji manifested uh, is very important for us in the jurisprudence sense but uh, the basic ethos as you have said not only in the upanishads but also in everyday life you know if you if you see for example anil gupta's work through the honey bee network so much of it is a documentation of this trusty ethos uh, you know in the really in the kind of in the dna of uh, Uh, the indigenous social and creativity systems so then i'm puzzled about one thing uh, you know because see you you make a very challenging claim that gandhi can be seen as the intellectual descendant of the scottish enlightenment tradition of david hume and adam smith now of course many people will you know uh, at first glance immediately say oh this must be a force fit and yet you pull it off but my <laughs> question to you is that why do we need to in a sense measure gandhi against the scottish enlightenment no i i am being deliberately I, provocative i here. might not have made this i am not suggesting that he derived his ideas from them i am saying that you know these things happen when different ideas 20000 miles apart 
four centuries apart can be similar. There can be amazing yeah. synchronicity, as they say. Uh, the, the point I was trying to make is that general intellectual view on Gandhi, particularly among Western academics and Indian academics trained in Western uh, uh, academia, is that Gandhi has a lot in common with what they call the other West. Ah. With Tolstoy, oh, and, Tolstoy with Kuro, and so on. And in fact, he might even have something in common with Marx because uh, alienation, enemy, those are issues that Gandhi was struggling with. Oh, and the rights of the worker, Gandhi is deeply yes. occupied, uh, preoccupied with the basic problem of exploitation. Yeah, and no, and he's also with uh, grinding pauperism because that was the overwhelming problem of yeah, India yeah. in 1920. And he, can, and he can see the genesis of it. Yeah, yeah. He Why bought, it exists. He was yeah. completely into the Dada Bhai Navroji, Ramesh Chandra, that school of the drain theory. Yeah. And that's why he opposed imperialism in part, not just for that's political right. reasons, for economic reasons that the imperialism with its exchange rate and its tariffs was actually creating poverty in India. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the point I am trying to make is that Associating Gandhi only with Tolstoy, Thoreau, Ruskin is not fair. Correct. Even mainstream uh, Scottish Enlightenment uh, traditions, and there's much in common between Smith and Gandhi. That's the point. That's that was the purpose of that chapter, Adam yeah. Smith and the Mahatma, yeah. saying, yeah. "Hey, wait a minute." Independently, and I particularly, you know, this was also lucky. Uh, uh, Amatya Sen pointed this out to me that all you people only read Wealth of Nations. Why don't you go and read Theory of Moral Sentiments, Moral sentiments. which was published yeah. more than a decade before Wealth of Nations. And, and then, by the way, start, Jerry, yeah. you know that it is it is Theory of Moral Sentiments that he kept revising right up till his Correct. death. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. And there was discussion him, on the Smith British. Himself, there it was, was the discussion on British of rule in India in TMS. Yeah. Discussion yeah. on yeah. that. So, so Jerry, let's look at a detail on this Adam Smith and Gandhi, uh, in a sense, uh, dynamic that you are seeing. You say, for example, that you see a connection between Adam Smith's impartial spectator concept yes. of the impartial spectator and Gandhi's still small voice within. But Gandhi's reference is to a voice that is rooted in his search for the divine. You know, and so what is the nature of this overlap that you're seeing on this spe impartial spectator versus the still small voice? And that when you suggest that today we can benefit by drawing on both Smith and Gandhi, what does that mean? Okay, you know, this is where the Ga Gandhi himself comes to our help, at least to the help of people like me who are looking for these things. Yes. There is, Smith is a, an agnostic and Gandhi is a deeply religious believer. Impartial spectator, still small voice. They seem similar, but can they be? And then I come across Philipson's book where actually Philipson himself mentions, he's written a very nice book on Smith, that look, even in his time, many people realized that Smith's impartial spectator could be likened to the deity. So suddenly the agnostic, even though he's an agnostic, may have actually made reference to a god, mm -hmm. even if it's indirect. In Gandhi's case, there's at least two, three places where he says, especially when talking about trusteeship and obligations uh, and action, he says, uh, the gods will help. And then he says, of course, there are no gods. We are all going to together get this done. So the, the, even though he was deeply personally religious, he was able to frame many of his moral ethical stuff within relatively agnostic uh, uh, you know, regions, if you will. So you know, it is, it is it's, it's always difficult to take a religious person and to take an agnostic and to make those connections. Except that Gandhi's religiosity is also very strange. He can be many things in different uh, situations. And Smith too, I don't believe was 
that simplistic an atheist which Hume was. Now with Hume, it's very difficult to make uh, parallel connections, except maybe a little bit in experimentation and empiricism, because Hume was an out and out raging atheist. Uh, so that's why I didn't write a chapter saying uh, Mahatma and David Hume, that would not have worked. But with Smith, I was able to see parallels and as I said, synchronicities. Yeah. So I, uh, I mean, maybe we can take this offline, uh, but I do want to put for the record, Jerry, that I think the world view in which Adam Smith is writing, the context, the social, cultural, even psychological context in which Smith is envisioning or struggling with the moral problems of uh, society and business is very radically different from the, uh, I think, uh, see, the reason is that Gandhi, I think, never suffers from the handicap of thinking that life is short, nasty and brutish. He's just not That's a Hobbes, that's a Hobbes, not a Smith. Yeah. So yeah. and, and no, somehow but, yeah. Gandhi was saved from going down that completely futile track because now we have science telling us many behavioral sciences are now telling us in case we don't want to take Gandhi's word for it. Uh, I, I say this only for the benefit of those who don't want to take Gandhi's word for it, that behavioral sciences are telling us that that is not the reality of even primitive man. You know, no, I, so I, I, they, they, I, you know uh, uh, Mandeville, they are, uh, Adam Smith is a product of the world created by Mandeville and the fable of the bees, right? That vice is virtue. And it is that vice is virtue emergence in Western Europe. This idea that you can get the best out of people by appealing to the worst in them. This idea is what leads Adam Smith to do you know to struggle with this question of moral sentiments and uh, I don't agree so, with you. <laughs> tell me why I, I i that is a reading of the wealth of nations that appealing to self interest will lead to general wealth no no i'm referring to theory of moral in, sentiments in theory of what moral drives him to write it he, he is very clear that we seek and he doesn't explain why. He just says it is embedded in our consciousness that we seek approval of the impartial spectator. It's, and it is not, and this is something very important. It is not because we seek praise. We don't do praiseworthy things in order to seek praise. We do praiseworthy things in order to satisfy that impartial spectator. So I think on this one, Smith is, it is more Hume uh, who was also Mandeville's protege, who, who thinks of everything in, in relatively, um, what shall I say, amoral uh, uh, terms. Smith is concerned about the fact that duties, obligations come out of our, it, it, we, 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 we cannot escape the impartial spectator. In a sense, we are there. That, that's part of the human predicament. Well, I mean, but the point is, uh, Jerry, that if that were working, if actually capitalism was working on that basis, then we wouldn't be now in the situation which we are, as as you know. Yeah. The, and uh, Smith warned us, Smith repeatedly warned us huh. that merchants, when they get together, will try to sabotage. Uh, people will use a regulatory capture, political power. And yeah. he was totally opposed to East India Company and to imperialism. He actually supported the 13 colonies in their revolt. And, and, and he was against uh, British imperialism in India, especially conducted through a rapacious company. Uh, and but, so but Jerry, I, I, want, I, I want to bring us to something that is uh, more urgent, which is that can we today separate capitalism from the idea of indefinite economic growth? And that is to me the crucial issue going forward. If trusteeship is to be anything more than, you know, an idea in books. See, because for example, you do refer to the need for orderly growth. But what about the absurdity, you know, of an entire global economic order that is premised on indefinite and perpetual growth on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. So how do you respond to that? I don't, and I don't what think are the, what, are, what are the clues that you're getting for that immediate, which is now an existential crisis? 
I don't think you will get answers from either of them because they lived in time periods and in contexts where this issue did not arise. As far ah, as Gandhi, Gandhi was, anticipates it. Jerry, in the mid 40s, he is saying that and, and at a level of consumption that the West had in the mid 40s, he is saying that if the whole world started to live like the West, we would need three pan planets. So he does anticipate the problem. Yeah, that, but it's but, not but, unimaginable but, by 1947. Having anticipated it, he is still not saying, therefore, let us reduce economic growth or anything. You know, they, they, he's still worried about how to get rid of grinding paupers. That that remains yes. an obsession with him. So yes. I think he see you you have to see that the man 1906 to 1948 which is his intellectual development phase. In that context, what he says, and in Smith, you have to talk about the 1700, 1750 to 1800. You have to talk about the context that they lived in. We can get some insights, like you've just picked one up about consumption from Gandhi, but I don't think you'll get a whole lot more because at that time, it was, it was important for him. So if we start looking uh, beyond insights into more detailed, coherent answers from our intellectual ancestors, yeah. then we are failing. Then we are not doing what Gandhi did. Gandhi took ideas from his intellectual ancestors and put them in for his context and his time. We need to do that. I think this is a task that people living today need. And yes, we will get some insights. We'll get some ideas from from Smith and from Gandhi, but they, they will not be sufficient. And unless we recontextualize themselves to today, for instance, I think Alstrom has done this when talking about, uh, uh, you know, um, natural resources, lake, you know, a river. Is that held That's in right. trust? Is That's that right. held and, in trust? Water body. And also, all, yeah, and also by debunking that tragedy of the commons kind of thinking, which completely overlooked indigenous systems across the non-Western and non-modern world, which cared effectively and efficiently for commons. No, it, 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 the point is even in the Western world, they did care. They did. But but again, you see, the problem with these things, Rajni, is Smith writes a book, 1776. Over the next hundred years, the evolution of these utilitarian school, they take over. And after that, we assume that Smith said this. He didn't. Many of these ideas of tragedy of commons. No, 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 no. No, no, no. It's not only about Smith. Jerry, Jerry, it's not limited to Smith. Come on. You know that capitalism stands on the destruction of commons, number one. And I don't know. Hey, this is your position. I'm not sure is, of that. No, no, it's not my. It's not my position in that I am the first one to say it, or I'm saying anything remotely original. After all, if you if you look at Polanyi, what is Polanyi saying? That firstly, that bazaars and commerce are far older than capitalism. So that's actually I want to come to that that I find that you don't perhaps sufficiently distinguish that, uh, Jerry. Mm -hmm. And I think the central importance of Gandhiji is that, that it, you're right about his Banya roots giving him deep access to certain indigenous insights. I, it, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter whether they are indigenous or not. They are not. profound insights. That is what matters. But the fact, if we are to really appreciate the significance of that, we must accept that that is not capitalism as it is known today. No. Capitalism is a recent invention of maximum maybe two and a half, three hundred, uh, you know, 250, 300 years uh, duration. And commerce and the struggle of what is, in, what is required, what is sufficient, what is greed, uh, you know, where does uh, enterprise get overwhelmed? by uh, greed for power. All these are old questions. They are not new questions. But I, I, I wanted to provoke you to say, how do you see this question today? I, I see, I don't see it the way you see it. Let me put it quite simply. I see market capitalism as an extension of the age old commercial mercantile traditions of human beings. I do see a problem 
particularly i would say in the last 200 years or 150 years of responses to problems and crises of market capitalism being purely technocratic or legalistic in nature and not moral in nature yeah, say that, that say is more where about gandhi that. comes in yeah, gandhi say more about comes, this jerry gandhi Please. comes in because ah. he and so it was what is the early spent because the response has to be moral take a look at 2008 yeah what happened after that the us congress process frank dodd which is an 800 page legal document so all you are looking for is a legal technocratic solution to the crisis of 2008 and everything is about contracts in fact i mentioned that the yeah. jensen and meckling and farmer approach to uh, the agency problem which also involves you know uh, the trusteeship ideas is let's let's have a contract and you know tirole the french economist makes it quite clear trust has to precede contracts nobody is saying don't do contracts you and i have a contract that at so and so time we have to finish this session of course we need that but we also have to have trust i mean and trust has to precede the contract fair enough and, you fair know enough. look at it rajni he could have said to his rich ahmedabadi and bombay capitalist and for that matter south african capitalist friends ki be nice be sympathetic be good be charitable um uh, he didn't he said be trustees the 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 choice of words is very important it comes as i say from these five different roots that he goes back to and gets it from there that's right so therefore i am saying that see because you are going to be i think there's going to be a lot of mud thrown at you for saying that gandhi is a capitalist you are not saying that not in a literal sense or at least not, not at in all. Some, i am just not saying in reductionist sense i am just saying that there are parallels between smith and gandhi is to that, dismiss gandhi only as thoreau and tolstoy who are considered marginal intellectuals in the west the other yes. west if you will and not mainstream went is is incorrect there are parallels even with somebody as solid as smith and i have taken one modern example i have taken akerlof and cranton who are modern behavioral economists and say i have said more about that jerry this is a good point why didn't you say a bit more about that please see about 20 years ago they came out with a brilliant paper which then became a book called identity economics akerlof is he won a nobel prize many years ago for some other brilliant work he's done and then uh, cranton his uh, colleague they basically they were very clever they didn't say we don't believe in utilitarian economic economics which they don't but they said if you if you believe in utilitarian economics we will find a way to fit our ideas into your world view so he said people don't derive utility only from wealth or from income or from consumption goods they also derive utility from their identity a and then identity is very funny it's not just what modern identity woke the discussions are many parents when they go to a school pta meeting the child will tell them i want you to be a cool parent like that girl's parent so cool parent is an identity that parents seek so the, the, there are uh, you know and, and in the whole uh, gender thing in in us corporations 20 30 years ago the view expressed to women was become like men then you will get promoted you know don't worry about child rearing don't worry about this be aggressive <clears throat> and gandhi inverts this yeah. he says no 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 it's not the bully uh, who is uh, brave it is a resilient woman and and that he, so he actually feminizes stuff so today in i can you talk about the gandhi neuron also yeah in identity economics if you were to advise a young woman you want a good career it may not be imitate men and he did this in caste that's right you no know, right. before him most reformers used to tell lower castes give up you know these uh, occupations and take up more 
uh, higher occupations. Gandhi inverted it. He told his upper caste people, "You make leather sandals. You clean toilets." He said, "Hey, identity can be, you know." I'm talking about Gandhi neurons. That's I stumbled on this in V. S. Ramachandran's book. See, we go back to trust. The word trust precedes the word trusty, precedes the word trusteeship. Right? Trust is it where it comes from? I trust you. And Fukuyama, so many scholars have talked about the importance of trust in modern societies, for that matter, in ancient societies. It turns out that if I take an injection of oxytocin, I become more trusting of you. I'm not suggesting that we all start taking injections of oxytocin, and I'm not even suggesting that Gandhi would have supported it. But there is a physic. But Gandhi would have smiled and said, "I told you guys, trust is there in the human nature. This idea that uh, we are brute, selfish brutes is not true. There's a divinity in us. And the Gandhi neurons. We have a certain set of neurons in our head. When you feel pain, my those neurons get activated." When you feel, not when I feel pain, when I see you feeling pain, those particular neurons fire. And Ramchandran, who is a great, one of the greatest living neuroscientists in the world, he has called them Gandhi neurons. So it's interesting that our Mahatma's name has gone to this new discovery in neuroscience, which tells us that there is a divinity, that that still small voice, that moral conscience exists yeah. within us, and which is what he was appealing to. and i think without yeah. dealing with that let me tell you because if we are only going to say efficiency markets are good because the reagan thatcher movement was all about state control doesn't work markets work therefore let's go for markets and 2008 has proved that kind of very questionable if the response is only going to be that markets are efficient or they they work well they're operationally good that's not going to cut it because there will be crises and there will be i looked i went back and did a word search by the way in 2008 in different newspapers greed selfishness avarice these were the words used in common magazines and blogs but the legislation that came out of us congress there is no reference there even in the introduction there is no reference to morality i mean i don't yeah, think so it will suffice no no so jerry i think you are getting to the heart of the matter here this is precisely what worries me also and i think maybe this is where i uh, request you to respond to this thing that zizek has said right why is it easier to now imagine the end of the world thanks to climate chaos but not the end of capitalism when we when we say use the word capitalism here we are referring to all the rogue behaviors that you have just highlighted you know so this, where does this leave us no it will end if there is if there is no adequate moral response on the part yeah. of our societies because we have got we've got our northern neighbor right now proving that they can be very efficient because it's not just capitalism fukuyama talks about democratic yeah. capitalism so we have, we have always associated yeah. markets with freedoms and and now if you they will say forget it we can do it we can get efficient outcomes without this and it will end that's why i'm saying if we if we are defenders of some variant of democratic market capitalism some variant i don't care which one yeah. then we i think we will gain a lot by paying attention to gandhi don't just dismiss him excellent please read him because i and, and let me tell you the technocratic and legal response is greatly insufficient you cannot craft laws you have to change the uh, some of the very fundamental discussion which means in yeah. economics departments and business schools don't just teach wealth of nations and that to one sentence from wealth of nations these theory of moral sentiments they prescribe gandhi's uh, 1916 speech in allahabad prescribe no, these things and be john ruskin yeah absolutely who who who's uh, influenced gandhi so much but we must get this idea that 
there is a moral philosophical dimension to economics, which particularly these econometric statisticians people over the last hundred years, even, even the best of them, their main argument will be, don't do this, this actually hurts the poor. Uh, don't do this. Uh, when, when they come with an objection, yeah. they will never say, oh, I have got measures to show, prove that this doesn't help. Are, yaar, is it right or wrong? Have you talked about the ethical issue? Is Does this appeal to the sacred within us? No. Yeah. And Smith was concerned, Gandhi was concerned, and we should be concerned. So, you know, it's ironic, Jerry, that you're writing this book, uh, I mean, you've written this book and published it at almost the precise point where uh, this concept of triple bottom line, responsible, socially responsible investing or ethical investing, all this has reached, you know, it's almost now 30 years old. Okay, and if we say it's absolute mainstreaming, when did the UN adopt principles of responsible investing? Even that is now 15 years old. Um, and I am hoping now this is uh, as 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 your co-panelist here, I'm going to use that to say, okay, I wish you will now write a book addressing where that energy goes, because there are two very sharply divided schools of thought. One is saying that, look, this is not getting us anywhere. It's been a very noble quest to bring ethics and morality into investing, but it's too little, too slow, too late. The other view, which my friend Nick Robbins has articulated actually in a Ahimsa conversation, Nick, he was one of the people behind the UNEP's task force on sustainable investing. And his argument is that no, we are at the end of the beginning. Mm. This was all the beginning. And we can now leap from this to a much more intensive process of change. So I, I'm, I think your book and the kind of connections that you're making will be helpful in that, in that larger search. If, and I, 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 I need to believe that we are at the end of the beginning and bigger, better things are to come. You know, I, uh, I think if we had asked the Mahatma this question, hmm. his response would have been quite eccentric and difficult, but very real and very sharp. He what is that? He would have said, start, start with yourself. Because in fact, I've been now reading up all these organizational theories you find are top to bottom hierarchies, pyramids, uh, triangles. Gandhi was circle, concentric circles, individual yes. to family. to Oceanic build. circles. And so I think he, he would, he, he, and, and I think he would, he would kind of talk about it in a very, very, sensitive sense of intergenerational trusteeship. That's right. I think if, if we are not willing to accept that the world has been given to by the Lord to us in trust or by somebody to us in trust, and we have a contract with our ancestors who built step wells all over Gujarat, who built temple tanks all over Tamil Nadu, Interconnected, and regionally interconnected. You go to uh, Angkor Wat, you see the, the irrigation system that has been built. And if we don't think that we need to leave a planet and water systems and water bodies for our children and their children, at least as good or better, yeah. then that the, the, the morality of trusteeship will collapse. I think in, in, in the, I know many people are interested in Gandhi's attack on consumption when they look at environmental economics and that's valid. But I think his, this idea that we hold wealth itself as a, as a trust and, and, and to, to, to not pass it on to succeeding generations with, uh, uh, with enhancement or improvement or at least intact, but uh, denuded of all forests, all trees, denuded, deserted, then, you know, I, it seems to me uh, we, we would have missed out on an extraordinarily important insight of the man. Wonderful. Wonderful. Again, Jerry, congratulations oh. and uh, wishing you happy sailing in the oceanic circles, which is what Gandhiji called them. And uh, thanks again to BIC. Lekha, over to you. 
Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what we do, please share it with your friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S Sarunaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram for updates on all our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.